Well, this is uh, part two in the little series that I've called Preparing for Departure. And uh, last week, we were thinking about both Paul uh, and Peter as they referred to their departure in the last letters that we have that were written by them. And we were thinking very much about two great questions that these letters throw up. How will I look back and what will I leave behind? And what we're going to do this morning is we're going to read the introduction to Paul's letter to Timothy, his, his second letter as we call it, uh, and then next week we'll read the introduction to Peter's second letter, uh, which sets out the theme of what the men have to say to us as they contemplate their departure from this world to go to be with Christ. So I want you to turn to 2 Timothy, uh, and we're going to read the first 12 verses of 2 Timothy chapter 1. Paul writes, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as my forefathers did with a clear conscience as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I have been reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded, now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner. But join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am, yet I am not ashamed, because I know whom I have believed, and I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. Amen. I think a helpful image for us to have as we listen to Paul talking to Timothy is that of a ship in the process of leaving shore. The moorings have been loosened, and Paul is on that ship, and Timothy is on the shore, and this is Paul talking to him. He's in the very process of departing from him, and he wants to encourage Timothy who he is leaving behind in this world, who is continuing his service in this world. And if you spend time reading the letter as a whole, you will actually understand just how much Timothy was in need of Paul's encouragement. 
He was in an incredibly challenging church situation at Ephesus. Without going into it in any detail, but you'll find in the letter there were problems within the leadership of the church. Certainly there was problems with what was being taught within the church. There were issues with certain women in the church. There was the real need to look after certain people in the church, which wasn't happening. There was instruction required to the wealthy so that they would handle their wealth correctly. And into all that, I should just point out, you know, it, it would appear to me that the church that Timothy found himself in would be the sort of church that no modern pastor seems to get a call to. You know, it's just riddled with problems. And then you have Timothy himself. And we know that he's a relatively young man, because Paul writes, you know, don't let anyone look down on you in account of your youth. He didn't have the sort of seniority clout. We know that Timothy was frail in constitution in some sense. You know, take a little wine for your stomach. It's very probable that in respect of his temperament, Timothy was timid Tim Timothy. You know, God has not given us the spirit of fear and of timidity. In other words, Timothy finds himself in an incredibly challenging situation as Paul leaves both matters within Timothy and around him. So Paul, in the process of departing, is going to encourage Timothy. And I'm going to uh, suggest to you six encouragements that Paul gives to Timothy that will be just as relevant for us today as we continue with our service for the Lord. Here's the first one. The role of prayer. You'll notice in verse 3 there that Paul tells Timothy that he prays for him. He prays for him and he tells him that he prays for him. Don't underestimate just how encouraging that statement is to someone who's trying to serve the Lord. You can only say it with integrity if you're praying for them, but we can encourage one another by telling each other that we're praying for each other. And Paul points out that he is constantly praying for him, night and day. But then think about this. If it's really encouraging to know that Paul's there night and day praying for Timothy, well, hold on. Paul's going. So how will it encourage Timothy to know that Paul's praying for him when he's departing? Well, does God only answer our prayers in our lifetime? Did God have to stop answering Paul's prayers for Timothy just because Paul was in his presence? Of course not. I believe with all my heart that God is still answering the prayers of saints for me that were offered years ago. Why does he have to answer them when we're still around to comment on the answers? And in reminding Timothy of his prayers for him, Paul's doing a very important thing. He's reminding Timothy that he and himself is not sufficient for the task that he has to do. And it's actually a tremendous place to be in your service for God to know that you are insufficient in yourself. And the other side of that coin is, it is a tremendously dangerous place to be if you think you can wing it, if you think you can do it in your own strengths and resources. So I think we should 
as we hear Paul reminding Timothy of his unceasing prayers for him, we should ask ourselves, you know, where does prayer fit into our Christian walk and service? I'm not asking you what the right answer is that we should all pray. I'm just saying, as I ask myself, where does it genuinely fit in? Where does it genuinely fit into the work of Castle Ray Fellowship? If you were with, to have the sight that God has, the insight, if he were looking at the foundations of this work in Castle Ray Fellowship, would he see a prayerful people? Or would he see people who are continually active uh, and undoubtedly talented and equipped and gifted uh, with plentiful resources, but not genuinely people of prayer. That is a very, very real temptation and trap for us as God's servants, especially when we have got lots of resources and lots of gifts. So the role of prayer, and the second thing, the second encouragement, I think, is the reality of fellowship. Verse 4 is actually one of the most emotional verses in the whole of the New Testament. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. You know, we have the wee joke term of bromance, where, you know, two guys have just got that incredible bond. There's a togetherness. When I read that, you just, you realize how moved Paul is. He remembers Timothy crying. And he longs to see him, really earnestly wants to see him. And if he does that, he'll just, there'll just be unbridled joy. Isn't that a remarkable thing? And it's even more remarkable when you realize how little these two men had in common. They were from different generations. Timothy was a young man, Paul was not. They were from very different backgrounds. Paul came from a position of privilege. He was a Roman citizen, which was no small thing. He was an academic, sat at the feet of Gamaliel. Timothy, on the other hand, was the product of a mixed marriage, Jew Gentile, and he had a very different personality, clearly, to Paul, that sort of timid idea. Paul could be very forceful as required. So there's actually one explanation for the togetherness that these two guys had, for this incredibly strong relationship. And the one explanation is their togetherness in Christ and their partnership in the work of the gospel. In other words, it was what they possessed together in Christ and what they pursued together in Christ that just pressed them together. Their riches in Christ, which they shared together, and their responsibility to Christ, which they sensed together. And let me say from the bottom of my heart that there is nothing like this bond in Christ and this togetherness in the gospel, this partnership in the gospel. I am absolutely convinced it is one of the greatest gifts and the greatest helps on our way to glory. Genuine Christian fellowship. 
So can I ask you, are you pursuing, are you investing in relationships like that? Because there is a danger that in our relationships, they're, they're largely functional, but they're not actually fellowship. You know, we do stuff together. There's lots of activity and all that. They can be functional, not really fellowship. Or alternatively, another subtle one is they can be friendship, but not fellowship. And don't think those two things are synonymous. We can be very polite and warm and friendly and talk about spurs and do this and do that. That can be friendship. Fellowship is togetherness in Christ and partnership in the work of the gospel. And it brings together people who don't have things in common like age and social status and educational background and all that there. Different personalities. And it's wonderful. The role of prayer... The reality of fellowship. Third thing that Paul would say to Timothy is about this, the sense of heritage. The sense of heritage. Paul knows he's going. And he talks about his spiritual ancestors. I thank God whom I serve as my forefathers did. But then he reminds Timothy as well of his heritage, he makes a very immediate application because he says, you know, I see the faith in you now that was first in your grandmother, and then in your mom, and now it's in you. And what Paul is doing there is he is impressing upon Timothy that the baton is now in his hand. Timothy, it's now your spot to play your part in that unbroken chain of testimony. If you think about th this river of faithfulness that flows down the century, faithfulness of, of testimony to God, Paul is saying those waters are now lapping around your feet, Timothy. The baton's now in your hand. What should you do, Timothy? Well, the famous verse, 1 Timothy 2, verse 2, the so-called Timothy principle. Here's what you do. The things that you've heard from me, say in the presence of many witnesses. Sorry, and the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men who will be qualified to teach others. Timothy, you just keep, it's just going to, percolate down through you to others now who'll just keep it going. The blessings of God are not just for purely for private consumption. They are for public distribution. And each generation faces the challenge of how the testimony to God will fare in its hands. And each individual Christian faces that as well. So can I ask, as I ask myself, are we ready to receive the baton? Do you know how you receive the baton? When that runner comes running towards you with the baton in your hand, you're not standing like this, standing stationary doing that. You're actually moving in exactly the same direction as the person with the baton. You're looking in the same direction, and as you move together, you just put your hand back and it's slipped in. You see, if you're standing still, you fumble the baton. And you see, if you're living life, I don't really take this seriously, but I, I'll man up. I'll, you know, it comes my time. Nope. Unless you're in motion, unless you're looking forward, you're not in shape to receive the baton, and you'll drop it. And the testimony will drop on your watch. So let's face that. A fourth thing that Timothy, that Paul would remind Timothy of, 
And it's the calling of God. It's interesting in those 12 verses that we read together, Paul actually only tells Timothy to do two things. Read it and check it. You're to develop your gift and you're to advance into suffering. So only two things he tells him to do. Fan into flame the gift you've got and join with me in suffering for the gospel, for the Lord. Verse 6 is a, it's a tricky one for the commentators. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. It's not one we need to fall out over. My, my own view is, is that it's probably referring to some specific spiritual gift, probably related to teaching, uh, but that is to be exercised in the power of the Holy Spirit. But the big point is this, that God's calling and his equipping always come together. Yes, Ephesus was a tough gig, but he was equipped for the task. But here's the thing, God's calling and God's equipping always come together, but there's nothing automatic about this. We must fan into flame. We must choose to advance into suffering. Spiritual gifts are like muscles. If you don't use them, you will succumb to muscular atrophy. They'll just seize. They're there, but they become inoperative, inactive. That's what spiritual gifts are. There is a danger with big church. I am not saying that this is inevitable in a big church, nor am I saying that a small church guarantees anything. But we all know that with greater numbers, it can be easier to hide, easier to be a passenger, a spectator, easier to neglect the gift that we've been given sovereignly by God through His Holy Spirit. So I want to ask you, what specific task has God equipped you to perform? Are you fanning into flame what God has worked in you so that you can do in His service. Remember Ephesians 2 verse 10. It's a verse that's been quoted a lot in recent weeks. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which He has prepared beforehand for us to do. God has kitted you out. You've got something specific to do that only you are crafted to do. Are you doing it? Are you fanning into flame the gift that God has given you to do? Fifthly, another encouragement for Timothy. The wonder of the gospel. I want to just read again how Paul describes this message which defines us as Christians. Verse 8, So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who has saved us and called us to live a holy life not because of anything that we have done, but because of His own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but is now, it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am, yet I am not ashamed. 
The very bottom line for every true Christian is this. I have to live for God because this salvation thing is just so incredible. It lights up my soul. Nothing compares to this. And Paul wants Timothy to draw deeply from the wells of salvation. He wants Timothy to launch himself out into the unsearchable riches of Christ. If you don't know what I'm talking about now, you're not saved. Just face it. If the gospel doesn't light you up, you don't really know the gospel. I get asked quite often about outreach. Um, you know, how do you go about it? What, what do you do with your men? What, any good events? You know, any good programs, all that stuff. That's the, that's the stuff we talk about. But I always say this, outreach is overflow. I don't care what resources you've got. How big an event you can put on, how glossy the brochures, how whatever. If people who know the Lord are not overflowing with the privilege of being saved, it's just stuff. You can chase courses and approaches and all that there, looking for some magic bullet. You see if the fuel in the tank is not just, wow, this Christ is amazing. And he's got my heart. If that's not there, it doesn't really matter what we're doing. Just, just activity. Sixthly and finally, he reminds Timothy through his example of the faithfulness of God. I love verse 12. It sort of doesn't read right at first go. Yet I'm not ashamed because I know, you expect, I know what I've believed. He doesn't say that. He says, I know whom I have believed. Paul does not just know the truth of the gospel, he knows the God of the gospel. And he says that he is convinced. And that's, you know, absolute persuasion. Certain assurance, total conviction, settled confidence, immovable trust, unshakable reliance. His confidence is in the ability of God, not in his ability. I know whom I have believed, and I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. None of this is in vain, Timothy. Not a smidgen of our labor in the Lord is ever in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Why? Because God is faithful. And we can know such contentment in our service for God without acknowledgement or approval or popularity or apparent success if we're doing it for him and we're leaving it with him. Absolute contentment that on that day, the story will be told. So, Paul, as he seals away, as he departs this world, he reminds Timothy of the role of prayer, the reality of fellowship, the sense of heritage, his calling and equipping, the wonder of the gospel, and confidence in God himself. In summary, Timothy, you'll be all right. And Paul would say the same to us today as well. If we cooperate with God and let him build those things into our life and service,
we'll be all right against that day.